Since his abrupt resignation from Mars Hill Church in 2014, Mark Driscoll has claimed he was the victim of a vindictive plot. But last week, he dropped a bombshell. He claimed that Mars Hill leaders were planning to accuse him of adultery if he didn't resign. Today, two former high-level Mars Hill leaders join me to set the record straight. Welcome to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Royce. And if you've been watching the news, you know that Mark Driscoll stunned just about everyone last week when he made a claim that he's never made before. Speaking to his congregation, Driscoll said the church leaders at Mars Hill were going to use a nuclear option against him if he didn't resign in 2014. That nuclear option was a plan to falsely accuse Driscoll of adultery if he didn't resign from the church. At least, that's what Mark says. Well, joining me today is Sutton Turner. Sutton was at Mars Hill when everything imploded in 2014. At the time, he was one of only three executive elders at Mars Hill, and he had a front row seat to everything that was happening. You'll also hear today from Miles Rohde. Miles was one of only eight elders at Mars Hill who investigated the charges of bullying and intimidation against Mark Driscoll. And Miles was at one of those meetings at Panera where Driscoll claims he learned of the plot against him. This is going to be an eye-opening podcast, and I'm so glad you've joined me. But before we dive in, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this podcast, the Restore Conference, and Mark Orta Barrington. Well, I'm so excited to announce the next Restore Conference, June 9th and 10th at Judson University in Elgin, Illinois. Joining us for this amazing two-day event to restore faith in God and the Church will be many leading abuse survivor advocates. These include Wade Mullen, Scott McKnight, Mary DeMuth, and Kyle James Howard. I'll be there as well, but by far, what makes this gathering so special is you, the survivors, allies, activists, and church leaders who truly desire to see healing and reform in the church. For more information, just go to julieroys.com slash restore. Also, if you're looking for a quality new or used car, I highly recommend my friends at Marcord of Barrington. Marcord is a Buick GMC dealership where you can expect honesty, integrity, and transparency. That's because the owners there, Dan and Kurt Marcourt, are men of integrity. To check them out, just go to buyacar123.com. Well, again, joining me today is Sutton Turner. Sutton served on staff at Mars Hill from 2011 to 2014, first as a general manager and then as an executive pastor and executive elder and board member. And Sutton has done something that Mark Driscoll has never done, and that is he has owned and apologized for the role that he had at Mars Hill, and he's gone back and reconciled with people. And so, uh, Sutton, I just really appreciate that you've done that. I appreciate the integrity that you've walked uh, this whole season uh, with. And so thank you so much for taking the time and for joining me. Thanks, Julie. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. And we've been talking about doing a podcast together for a really long time, so I'm, <laughs> I'm glad we're finally making that happen, although not so happy about the circumstances under which uh, we're doing this podcast. And, you know, my understanding is when you heard this allegation coming from Mark Driscoll, it hit you pretty hard, right? Yeah. And I, I think about the, the, the men that were elders at these Mars Hill churches that served so well during an investigation. I mean, like, pastors investigating their pastor. Um, many of the guys that investigated Driscoll were people that Mark led to Christ. Um, mm. and Mark, and they looked at Mark as a, as a father figure, um, and not only as a pastor, but a father figure. So, and, and that was one of the reasons why I just was like, you know what, I, I can't stand by and allow these statements to stick. Uh, and this narrative to stick because it hurts um, some really good men that are still uh, leading churches today, small churches in the Puget Sound and other areas that are serving God and and serving their people. And and I just I was like, you know what? I'm no longer a part of ministry and church leadership. And I feel like I have the ability to say, wait a minute, I was there, and let me communicate what actually happened. Isn't that kind of sad, though, that you almost have to be out of the evangelical whole celebrity machine complex ministry before you can speak? Although I will say, as I mentioned in the open, Miles Rohde, who is a former 
pastor uh, at Mars Hill, also elder, one of the elders who investigated Mark Driscoll. He did speak with me, and I'm going to be playing clips of our interview that I had with him earlier this week. Just really appreciate him being willing to speak as well. And he pastors one of those churches that was supposed to be a satellite of Mars Hill. And right when everything blew up, he had a church planting team ready to plant this church in Spokane. And they ended up planting. It's still a church. It's not a Mars Hill church, but wonderful uh, what's happened. And I know there's there's been a lot of redemptive things that have happened as churches uh, spun off from, from Mars Hill that were campuses there. I know many of the folks listening probably have heard clips of what Mark Driscoll said. Uh, to listen to the full context, you'd have to listen to what is almost an hour-long sermon. He's still giving very long sermons, which is uh, his sort of signature, I suppose. But he's there at the Trinity Church in Scottsdale, Arizona, and he gave this sermon uh, on Nehemiah on October 23rd. And uh, again, if you want to hear that whole thing, you can. It's still posted online last I looked. But I'm going to play a four-minute clip of what he said, and then uh, we'll unpack that together. Take a listen. Some years ago, um, we were in a season where massive media firestorm, lots of conflict and controversy. Um, said, okay, investigate everything. I know I'm not disqualified. I know who I am. I can't wait to stand before Jesus. It's going to be a great day for me. Not that I'm perfect, but I... I know who I am, and I know who he is. And, uh, and we were asked to return, and I'll share something with you I've never shared. I don't know if it's a good idea or not. I'll ask Grace. She just, she did this, so, okay, so. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, I was in one end of the house, Grace was in the other. God spoke to us both, said, you're re released, you need to resign immediately. And God told me a trap is set. He didn't tell Grace that. So she came in. She's like, God just spoke to me. I was like, God just spoke to me. And uh, she, I said, what did you hear? She said, we're released. I said, I heard we're released. And that trap was set. So, so we walked away. Didn't defend ourselves. Uh, took 18 months. Didn't do social media. Didn't do public ministry. Just wanted to heal up and be with my family and get them into safety in a very dangerous season of our life. And so during that time, I met with some of my critics and enemies, one-on-one -on -one or small group, people that had been friends, people who claimed to be Christians, some who were pastors, some who still are pastors. And I, I asked them, I said, uh, I said, God told me a trap was set. So I asked them, I said, do, do, do you know what that might be? And these people that we had known said, uh, yeah, the nuclear option was we were going to accuse you of adultery. This was at Panera, multiple meetings at Panera. I was like, you guys discussed accusing me of adultery. I was like, you know that's not true. I've been faithful to my wife my whole life. I adore my wife. I love my wife and she loves me. We've been faithful to each other. We've been open our whole marriage about any struggles we have had because we know that every married couple has some hardship to go through and we have never been dishonest but we have never done that. We've never done anything remotely like that. They said, yeah, that's why we kept it as the nuclear option. I was like, to get me what? They said, to get you out of the pulpit. They said, because we knew that if we accused you of adultery and enough of us signed the open letter, that ultimately there would be such a media firestorm that you would have to exit ministry, exit preaching God's word, for probably a year while a full investigation was done. During that time, we could take over and lead and be in charge. And, and then we figured one of two things would happen. Either you would come back, but we would be in charge, or you would never come back and you'd be done forever. I came home, I told Grace, I was like, oh my gosh. Multiple people told me that to my face on separate occasions and days. I want you to be, if I'm gonna be your pastor, and I love you, I promise you this, I'll always tell you the truth, and I want you to love and honor and respect Christian leaders and pastors. Don't assume the worst, assume the best. And don't believe everything you hear, and don't contribute to the gossip. 
that just takes lies and gives them life. The, the old preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he once said, he said, a lie can get around the world before the truth can get its shoes on. And today, every algorithm and every social media platform exists to send bad things about God's people as fast as possible, whether it's true or false. Wow. So, so much to unpack there and, and even watching your response as you're listening. Um, it, it's emotional, isn't it? Yeah. It's, and every time I hear his voice, it's brings back a lot of, uh, a lot of really, really bad memories. Um, so yeah. Hmm. And when he's talking about those men, um, these were the best men that I've ever known in my life. Um, and for him to say, you guys discussed adultery. This is exactly the reason why I released in January um, all of the notes of all of the investigative meetings from uh, September or excuse me, from August of 2014 through the time that Mark resigned. Um, I, um, th they're amazing notes. Um, I took out the elders' names. And I replaced them with numbers because who said what is not important. Um, but I did think that someone taking time to read through what these elders did and how they were praying for Mark and how they wanted Mark ultimately restored. They wanted to see him repent. They wanted to see him reconcile, but they wanted him to, to be restored. And, um, and that never happened. And then for him to say that those men were discussing adultery, it's just a flat lie. I mean, like I have every meeting note and let me just tell you, there was none. When he talks about a nuclear option, that was a word that I used in early 2013 when we were talking about setting up the board of elders and the nuclear option was basically uh, all of these churches being separated in independent churches, which actually is what happened. Mm -hmm. um, these churches did, but that was the nuclear option. Um, but, uh, and that was around an investigation of one of the three of us that were executive elders. If we were found um, guilty of former charges and we were having to be removed from our position, that was what that was. And then um and when he talks about an investigation would have to be launched, there was already an investigation of 25 formal charges that disqualified Mark Driscoll based on arrogance, domineering, and uh, what was the other one? Quick temperedness. Um, so like, like, and, and that's what he still doesn't acknowledge to today. He was found disqualified. And the people that investigated him and had over 20, or excuse me, over 40 different interviews with people that were directly sinned against, that's the information that they did. They did a full investigation. And that's why I produced all of those uh, notes so that it's, don't take my words for it. Read the people, the elders of the church that investigated Mark Driscoll, read their own words read how they wrestled with this horrible thing that they had to do um, and to go through and read Mark's response um, to being formal charges. Read how he blows up. Read all of those things and see for yourself. Make your own judgment. Don't allow Mark Driscoll to sit there and say that he can, <sighs> sorry, like for anybody mm -hmm. to be as arrogant to think that they can stand in front of Jesus. I mean, I'm sorry, like all of us fall short of the glory of God and Jesus is sinful life. We all have fallen short. So for anybody to me to say, I can't wait until the day I stand in front of Jesus and tell him how good I am. I mean, it's just, it's remarkable. It's, it's shocking to me. Um, so I just, those are my first. It gets me so upset um, when it went, went around those men like Miles Rohde. I mean, the reason why probably Miles was able to reach out to you, he he had a long history of military uh, career. 
that guy's not scared of anybody. Um, and I'll tell you, he's dang sure not scared of Mark Driscoll. And that's why he, he probably responded. Other of us, I know I was terrified of Mark when I lived, when I worked there. And most of those guys still eight years later are probably terrified of Mark as well. And that's one of the reasons why it, it, I'm, I'm still nervous to talk to you, but I know that I'm not in full-time ministry and I feel like that I am able to talk with you and share what happened. Yeah. Well, and Mark has threatened, I, I've seen it many times, uh, legal action. He's even bragged about, you know, I've seen the notes from uh, the Trinity Church, even where he's bragged about having this war chest of millions of dollars available to sue people if he needs to. And so that threat of lawsuit, from what I hear, uh, has been something that's been persistent and is always there in, in the background, although he hasn't, it's been more, more threat than actual action uh, up until this point. But let's, let's go back, and I, I would like to kind of retrace some things from 2014. One, because um, some of it, I, I think up until 2014 and maybe his, his fall, people are a little bit more clear on that. But what happened afterwards, to me, is really a, a part of this story that hasn't really been told that well. Um, the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, that podcast, which has been so popular and done so well, has done a great job of kind of taking it to there. But Mark's relaunched. He's at a church in, in Scottsdale, Arizona. He's getting back on the speaker circuit. He was just shown in a picture with Stephen Furtick, who was out there on the Elevation Tour. Uh, and the two of them, you know, took a picture together. What great buddies they are. Who knows? He's going to be like, you know, at a Furtick conference coming up, you know, or something. Uh, not that I have any information on that. I'm just saying it's the sort of thing that just these, these disqualified pastors uh, get up and spin a narrative, and then they're back. And I think this is an important uh, story to tell because it's not just Mark, it's a lot of people, uh, although Mark probably typifies it in a way few do. Um, so let's let's go back to, to 2014 um, and, and the events immediately leading up to uh, Mark's resignation. So there were, there were accusations of plagiarism. There was a, a scheme to pad book sales that came out, result source, there was uh, news that he had trolled uh, online discussion forums under the guise of William Wallace II, I think was his, his phone name, and he lambasted uh, male lesbians and fee men, women who act like women. I mean, he was just kind of mark on steroids uh, on those, those forums. Acts 29 in August 2014 kicks Mark out. Uh, of the Church Planning Network. And then on August 22nd, 2014, Warren Throckmorton publishes this letter by 21 former Mars Hill pastors accusing Mark of some of the things you said, persistent sinful behavior towards others, characterized by this pattern of abusive and intimidating conduct. And then we have nine current pastors at the time at Mars Hill writing a letter to their fellow, fellow elders saying Mark has a pattern of bullying and calling him uh, to step down. And I have to say, one, one thing I am so appreciative to the Mars Hill elders for doing is actually moving forward on some of these. And, and it's sad to say, and up until this point, unless a pastor had a moral fall, you couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> it was like this, this idea that just your character, you're such a nasty person and you're such a bullying person. You do not exhibit the character of Christ even though those those things are written in Timothy and Titus and what the qualifications of a pastor are, that he shouldn't be quarrelsome, he shouldn't have outbursts of anger, even though those are there, that was rarely called upon to, to disqualify a pastor. And so, um, but let me just pause there and ask you, since you had a front row seat, um, you were in this inner circle with Driscoll, there weren't, the, the executive elders were you, Dave Bruscus. And Mark, yeah. So that I mean, the three of you men, um, did you see these characteristics and qualities in Mark? The the domineering, the bullying. Oh, um, repeatedly, um, sadly, um, many times. See, I uh, in my role, um, all of the central staff reported to me. So everybody, we had two hundred some odd employees in the central staff resurgence, all of those things, Marcel books, Marcel music, everything like that reported up through me. Um, and then uh, I reported directly to Mark. He was my boss. 
Um, I also sat on the board with Dave and Mark. So we were the three that were on the board and we had four um, board members that were out outside. Um, and anytime that Mark went to speak, I was there. I, uh, I lived down the street from Mark. Um, I would typically meet him at his house and his uh, uh, executive assistant, and we would drive to wherever he was preaching. I'd be with him the whole time there, uh, there at this, uh, wherever we were preaching, and then I would come back. So, I mean, you could say during that time period between 2011 and 2014, nobody spent more time with Driscoll than I did. Uh, Dave and I were the only ones to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with Mark during those three-year period of time. We we had to isolate him because he was so um, harsh on, on staff members that we had to literally uh, relocate um, an office um, to house Mark. Um, and then Dave and I would go there as well um, on the days that we met. So, yeah, I, I saw a lot of that. Um, you know, and, and to not be... Uh, and, and, and some of the things that, so yes, there was a lot of accusations that were during, and it really started um, at, in 13, 2013. Um, but the, the, the formal charges, the 25 formal charges are, are listed. And I've actually, in my notes that I published, um, pulled some of those items when the uh, investigating elders um, uh, literally ask Mark about each one of those charges. And many of those you will read, he says, oh yeah, I did that. Oh yeah, I did that. He admits to the sin. Um, and um, so, yes, I saw some, um, and I'll just give you an example to give you um, from, from that. We were at um, Ballard. Um, that was one of our, our churches, our 15 churches locations, um, the oldest um, church location. Um, and uh, it was eight o'clock. So we had the, we had an eight o'clock service. So typically sometimes we would do five to seven services. Mark would preach five to seven services on a weekend and we would go to different churches typically. Uh, the eight o'clock service at Ballard was very young. A lot of young people would come. Uh, there was no time limit on the outside of it. So typically he could preach for as long as he wanted to. And um, one night we did a call to baptism. Um, he, uh, it was an incredible response to the gospel. A lot of people wanted to go and get baptized. During the day at Ballard, they had run out of towels and shirts because um, we would provide short shirts and shorts to people. So um, when I saw the response, I was trying to find a backstage, trying to find towels and things. The campus pastor and some of the other people were running. Mark, um, when he realized what was going on, you know, we're playing music. People are getting baptized. Mark grabs somebody by the by the throat against the wall and says, and I'll clean this up because there was a lot of cuss words. Um, but um, he was mad at the person for not having enough shorts and enough uh, shirts. And I'm about to rip your head off and uh, excrete down your neck. And this is full up against the wall with somebody um, that was uh, actually a pastor uh, of the church. Those are the types of activities. So when people say, mm -hmm. why were you scared of Mark? Like, like, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. you would be scared. Um, and this is also the person that you saw terminate people. Like, I mean, so, so. I, I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. There's an incredible move of the Holy Spirit. People are getting baptized, coming to Christ. Like, and awesome. In the, in the midst of that, that's how Mark behaves. I mean, this is, it's its mind-numbing. Like, I mean, I just, I've been in moves of the Holy Spirit, maybe not quite that dramatic, but I, I, just, I just can't, I can't fathom that you're so full of the moment of what God's doing and the love of God and the gra grace of God and, and to behave. And so, I mean, it, it makes you wonder what, what, what does he even 
Uh, yeah, that's that's just shocking to me. That's shocking to me. And so when you say like, did you see? Yeah, yeah, I sell mm. lots of that kind of stuff. Because mm. um, I was, you know, one of those people that was super close to Mark and saw him um, react to people. He had a massive temper. Um, still does, I'm sure. Um, that's why one of the charges was um, quick temperedness um, um, and abusive language. Um, that was, you know, um, so so anyway, to give you that, that's a specific example that I witnessed. There was many, many others, um, but that's kind of an extreme example of what we saw all the time. And that's why for a lot of people, they don't understand why there was such fear on staff. Um, and, and, um, incredible fear, um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and a culture of fear. And so I give you that as an example, one of the things that you were talking about, um, as we look towards the investigation of, of 2014 is how did the investigation happen? Cause a lot of churches might have charges or allegations against their pastor, but nothing ever happens. Um, mm-hmm. and so, um, if you go back to 2011, 2011, I had just arrived. Um, Jamie Munson had just left. I was b- uh, first the uh, general manager. And then um, uh, I was asked to take Jamie's role as executive pastor. Um, and result source was signed during that time period. And by October of 2011, I was shocked. Um, that result source could have been approved by a church board. And I'm coming from the outside. And result source again, this is the whole this is the company that bought like thousands and thousands of Mark's books to put so that his new book, what was it, Real Marriage? So that that book would get put on the New York Times bestseller list. So it's it's really a way to manipulate yourself into being a, a bestseller. It's totally buying the New York okay. Times bestseller title. And using church funds. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and so I was shocked at that. Um, coming from the outside and corporate world, I'm like, there's got to be uh, 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 authority and accountability somehow that this doesn't happen. So fast forward the spring of 2012, I set up a new board. Um, and I, and this is, I've talked about this before, but I asked Mark, who would you be accountable to? Because I know that there's, I mean, the current board, he was not going to be accountable to him. All of those guys worked at the church and all those guys, most of them he had led to Christ. Like there was not going to be any accountability in that group. And he said to me, someone with a larger church and a bigger platform. Those were the only people that I said, okay. And not knowing how big a church John Piper. So somebody like John Piper, he goes, no, I would never be accountable to Piper. Okay. And so I literally went down a list. Um, I didn't know many of these people, but I went for him and I was thinking, okay, these guys um, are, uh, and so put those together in a board of accountability. Okay. So those were four outside board members and then the three of us. Fast forward. So that was the spring of 2012. Fast forward uh, 12 months later, I realized that, yes, we had this outside board. But those guys were not participating in a ongoing basis to be able, if there was ever any allegations against Mark, and there started to be, Dave Kraft um, Mm -hmm. first came out with the allegations um, in in that early part. I was like, okay, we have to put together a group of people that are going to do an investigation of one of the three executive elders. So including me, including Dave Bruskis and Mark. Mm -hmm. And so- I formed what was called the board of elders and we went together and we put together this group of elders and they were lead pastors of the different churches, Mars Hill churches. So they're internal Mm -hmm. to Mars Hill and they were led by somebody that was not only on the board of elders, but he was also on the board of accountability with Mark and Dave and I. And so, so like he had one foot in, the the local church he was a volunteer elder which i thought was very important he was not on staff so he would not have you know some of those issues and so we formed that board of um elders the spring of 13 and really that's what is the group of men that went together in 14 
that did the interviews of 40 people that investigated the 25 formal charges and that found um, Mark disqualified on those three items. Several things. Uh, there's so many things that come to mind, actually, when you speak. Most most people, their eyes glaze over when it comes to church governance. And I get that. It's not really that exciting or sexy, but it is so super, super important. When you talk about the the outside elders, the board of, uh, what was it, board of overseers? Overseers and, advisors, and accountability. And accountability. That's what it was. Um that reminds me of a lot of these ARC churches right now, association of related churches. They have other mega church pastors who are supposedly holding the pastor accountable, with this, which is a joke because they're not there. And also, are their sympathies going to be with the celebrity pastor because they're one and they are a big mega church pastor? I mean, it's 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 really a, a bizarre governance model, but it's it's become you know something that's used in a lot of these churches. Well, in August of mm -hmm. 14. Okay. So this mm -hmm. is literally the month that these guys are, uh, that the board of elders is about to start the investigation. Mark is on sabbatical. Okay. Mm -hmm. He had been on sabbatical for two months. Acts 29 just cuts us out of being an Acts 29 church. I think it was like the 14th of August of 2014. I get a call. I was actually on vacation vacation in the same place that Mark was. Um, and I get a call from James McDonald, who was a part of the board of advisors and accountability for the whole mm -hmm. time since 2012. He called me and he said, I need to resign. I was like, you can't resign right now uh, of any other time. We need mm -hmm. you to be here and help us through this time period. And he said, and I will quote, I can't stay on this board because I don't want my elders to do the same thing to me that they're doing to Mark Driscoll. <laughs> uh, and and that does not surprise me because one, James was every bit the bully and every bit as arrogant as Mark. In fact, I had people tell me who knew both of them that that uh, James McDonald was kind of like the older brother to Mark. And when the two of them did, would get together, which we know from some of their antics at the Strange Fire uh, conference that... Um, John MacArthur had, you know, them in the parking lot. I mean, it's just two megachurch pastors in the parking lot passing out, you know, flyers and books. And I mean, it's just bizarre. So I hate to say it, but I was yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you were. I was <laughs> in the car with Mark and Dave. We yeah. met James at Strange Fire. Um, oh, wow. And that was on a dare. We were at uh, Act Like Men in Long Beach, California. Which was James right. McDonald's big thing. Which was James McDonald, but it, it had Matt Chandler. And I mean, it was the who's yeah. who. And it was act like men. I mean, quite frankly, the, the spirit of those was to me the spirit of William Wallace II, wasn't it? I mean, it was sort of this, I mean, promoting almost toxic masculinity as biblical. Not always. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was tempered with protect your, your wives and, and serve them, but also very... Over the top, it seemed. But but go ahead. Yeah, you were so you got a dare, no, and it, we were having breakfast. We had mm -hmm. uh, future lead Mars Hill lead pastor interns with us. Big long table. Mm -hmm. James is you know bigger than life, holding court with all of these young pastors, and uh, uh, who who and James had a relationship with MacArthur and said you know wouldn't it be funny, Mark? if we went over and dropped in on strange fire and it was like a light bulb and Mark, like a dare big brother, daring the little brother. And he was like, mm -hmm. and he turned to his executive assistant and said, don't we have a couple of boxes of books? And he was like, yes. And he goes, I'll go sign books at, uh, and let's go. And literally we got up and headed that way. Wow. And, it was, and Dave Brusque, and I can't, I don't want to speak for Dave. I'll say for myself, that was one of the most embarrassing. Like if I look back on mm. foolishness and sinful behavior that I participated in right there, like there's not a better example of some of the foolish, sinful behavior mm. that I participated. In. And I have to own that. Like, and, and I've tried to own that as much as I can by doing stuff like this and meeting one-on-one -on -one with the people that I've offended and sinned against. Um, but I, I at the same time need to communicate some of the sinful behavior and the and the foolish behavior that I did with Driscoll so that people can see what is now happening eight years happened way back then. Yeah. 
and, and not that I don't think Strange Fire deserved being pushed back on, but there's a way to do things. And showing up in the parking lot is not the way uh, that I would suggest doing that. Um, so let's go to, we've talked now about the investigation that, that came, and, and it was led by eight elders. Uh, interestingly, though, it, they weren't independent elders in the sense that normally you like to get as many independent elders as possible who, who aren't on the payroll because, I mean, I've seen it firsthand. Like, I've been threatened when I was at, at Moody by, by a trustee member. You know we're going to tell the president about this or we've told the president about this. And, and so there is a fear of blowing the whistle or of trying to hold accountable because you're going to lose your job. But, but these men, uh, bravely, you know, from everything that I've seen, did step up and did do a honest uh, investigation. And so we've mentioned Miles Rohde, who was one of those eight. I have spoken to him. And uh, he describes the meeting and, and the results of what they got and then that meeting and what happened and what their heart was when they delivered uh, the results of that. So take a listen. The last meeting that I remember having was letting the board know what our findings were which were quick-tempered, arrogant, and domineering. And then we listed a potential plan for him to receive some counseling and care, as well as work with those who would be older than him, that he respected, who were outside of the church, who would serve as a mentor and as a kind of a, a, a coach of sorts through reconciliation. And that's what we presented. It's much more detailed. It was very hope-filled because we took First Timothy 5, 18, very seriously, that it was persistent in these, thin, these sins in which we found him to be, that he was to be rebuked publicly before the church, and then brought into a, a process of restoration over a course of time, which was not determined at that time. And then he resigned and made it all moot. Well, let me just ask you, was there any desire to get rid of Mark? On that board? No, there, there wasn't a desire. There was a desire to protect the flock, and there was a desire to see what the Lord had done in and through Mark and in and through Mars Hill to be done again, the Lord to do that, and to even tell a better story than in the first 18 years. Nobody had an ax to grind. Nobody was saying that he needs to go. Uh, indefinitely or, you know, to kick him out, but that he needed to be removed so that the process of healing for the church and for his own soul could be allowed to take place. And we weren't using the disqualifying word at that time, but I think his actions of resigning the way he did proved, in my opinion, from that point, that was disqualifying for someone not willing to enter into a process that is obvious for um, the health and protection of the church, as well as his own soul, proved ultimately to be disqualifying. So according to Miles, the heart of the elders was restoration. There was no plot. There was no trap. In fact, that doesn't seem to make sense for me, because what I've seen is Everybody understands at a big mega church like this, especially with the kind of platform, and, and even Driscoll used to say, I am the brand, right? Mm -hmm. And he was the brand. And if he leaves, everybody understands, we're not sure this thing survives without our charismatic leader, right? I mean, it, was that an understanding of the board? I, I think that um, it, if you read the notes from these men at the time, just kind of mm -hmm. like what uh, Miles was saying. Um, like the, the day before two day, yeah, day before the, the formal charges were sat down with Mark and, and red and where mm -hmm. Mark blew up. Um, one of the elders says, I want him to hear it, that we love him and that it's for him to see us as not for him, not to see us as his enemy. I really want this to be expressed to him tomorrow. Like these guys really loved Mark and they wanted to see him healthy um, and in a healthy place. 
and they wanted to see him restored. Um, but unfortunately, and, and by the way, you have to also understand the context of Mars Hill. Mars Hill took church discipline very, very seriously. And mm-hmm. you can't leave a church on church discipline. That was the, that's what Mars Hill believed that you had to stay in and work through those issues before you were able to leave Mars Hill Church or Mars Hill Church would not give you like a bill of good health or whatever you want to call it. And what do you what do you think of that today? Oh, it's ridiculous. I mean, everything. <laughs> so it was so controlling and just yeah. over the top. Oh my gosh. Because that I, is the exact I, same thing. I participated thing. in that. So I mean, that's the same thing I heard. I mean, I know at John MacArthur's church when Eileen Gray, you know, when they excommunicated her for simply wanting, you know, her husband out of the house who was abusing her children. And then she gets disciplined for it. She wasn't allowed to leave the church when she asked because she realized this is ridiculous. I want to leave the church. She wasn't allowed. Right. And and Harvest had similar things. I mean, it's it's just how church discipline is is used as a club. True. Totally. Right. But but the double standard, I think, is what you're getting to. Absolutely. Because so so Mark, which would never let somebody leave the church in the history of Mars Hill on church discipline ever, mm. um, like that he would leave basically on church discipline is shocking. And, yeah. and I honestly think, and this is my opinion, it's not in the notes. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that anybody really thought that he was going to quit. Because it was so foreign to the culture, especially in mm. the eldership, that somebody would leave that's an elder on church discipline like that, that would just not even occur. And of course, it occurred in a historic way. Um, and Mark now says that God, he uses the God card, God mm-hmm. told him to leave. And now he had to use that God not only told him to leave, but he told him that it was a trap. And now we're adding on. So by the way, this story first started. So Mark called me that, uh, I think it was Saturday night. That would have been uh, the 13th of October of 2000. And the night before. No, this was, you know, this is Saturday. Yeah, wait, this was, no, this was a Sunday, the 12th, October, 2014. Mm-hmm. He called me and said, you know, I talked to Larry uh, Osborne and he just doesn't feel like that we're going to able to to get out of this uh and and you know, we went on basically he was saying that Larry had told him what had happened um in the conversations with the BOO which wasn't supposed to happen. And then secondly, he told me that, you know, board of overseers and advice. And that was the first yeah. time he used the word trap, you know, just feels like mm-hmm. a trap. But it was not like there's a trap. Ah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then fast forward, the first time I ho- heard uh, Driscoll using that um, was the same month in October at Gateway Church. I listened to Mark and I'm like, there's a trap? When, where did this start? And that was one of the reasons why I released all those notes is because this story continues to evolve Mm-hmm. It, to, for Mark to be the victim. And, um, and, and I just want real information out there for real people to read and go, okay, this is total make-believe. This concludes part one of my interview with Sutton Turner. But in part two, you'll hear Robert Morris and Mark Driscoll at the 2014 Gateway Conference just six days after Mark abruptly resigned. And you'll hear the crafting of a narrative, a narrative that's very sympathetic to Mark. But as Sutton says, it's very far from the truth. You'll also hear a 2015 interview between Mark and Hillsong's Brian Houston. And in this one, it's quite clear Mark believes he's the victim. Lord revealed to me that, you know, uh, a trap has been set. There's, there's, there's no way to, for us to return to leadership. And I didn't know what that meant or what was going on at the time. And um, um, I said, he said, we're released and we need to resign. So You'll also hear more from Miles Rohde and what actually happened in those meetings between Mark and Mars Hill leaders at Panera. And you'll hear the heartbreak both Miles and Sutton feel, not just for people still being hurt by Mark Driscoll, but for Mark himself. 
This is a powerful story, and I believe it has so much to teach us about leadership and accountability in the church. Again, thanks so much for listening to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Royce, and just a reminder that we're able to do this podcast and all our investigative work at The Roy's Report because of support from people like you. If you appreciate our work here at The Roy's Report, would you please consider donating to help us continue? To do that, just go to julieroys, spelled R-O-Y-S, dot com slash donate. That's julieroys, dot com slash donate. Also, just a quick reminder to subscribe to The Roy's Report on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. That way, you'll never miss an episode. And while you're at it, I'd really appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word about the podcast by leaving a review. And then please share the podcast on social media so more people can hear about this great content. Again, thanks so much for joining me today. I hope you were blessed and encouraged.